You're listening to the Fertility Docs Uncensored Podcast, featuring insight on all things fertility from some of the top-rated doctors around America. Whether you're struggling to conceive or just planning for your future family, we're here to guide you every step of the way. Today's podcast is brought to you by Ovation Fertility, a leader in the field of IVF lab services. Ovation partners with some of America's leading fertility specialists to provide a range of services to support fertility treatment, including fertility testing, IVF, egg donation, surrogacy, genetic testing, and long-term storage of reproductive material. You can learn more about Ovation at OvationFertility.com. Hi, everyone. We're back with another episode of Fertility.Uncensored. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Abby Eblen from Nashville Fertility Center. And today I'm joined by my co-host and my wonderful, sweet, kind friends, Dr. Susan Hudson from Texas Fertility Center. Hey. And Dr. Carrie Bedient from the Fertility Center of Las Vegas. Hello. So how are you guys doing today? We are good. It got cold in Texas. What's it like the all places? Oh my gosh. It was 70 degrees and looked like spring yesterday. It was beautiful. It was 80 degrees here. Now it's 40. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We, we had great weather. How about you, Carrie? You probably had hundred degree weather in Las Vegas. No, it is freaking cold here. Like it has gotten cold enough that I have had to wrestle with my lemon tree because I have to cover it up every, like starting around December, January, I have to start covering up so he doesn't get too cold at night um, because he gave me three lemons this year. And I am very grateful because I got this tree. We planted it maybe three, four years ago. And, and this is the first year that he has yielded fruit. And so like it just, they just turned yellow. And so I'm like, okay, I need, I can take them off the tree now. Like it's cause I, I fuss at all of the other creatures in my house of like, don't you touch this tree until these green lemons turn yellow. And fortunately the birds and the other critters don't, don't go for it. It's more of the, the two-legged critters, but yeah, I'm very pleased. I have a fig tree, Carrie, and that's how I'm about my fig tree. I'm not going to wrap up and put the leaves around and wrap my fig tree this year because it's big enough, but this is the best year I've ever had. She did a good job this year. So next year, hopefully it'll be better yield. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there's like, I I see going to Nashville and having like bacon wrapped figs in our future. So you hopefully so. That's what I'm hoping for too. Well, so we were just talking a minute ago, we were kind of reminiscing, you know, now that unfortunately COVID's taken kind of another surge up, we were kind of thinking back to the holidays and just back to parties in general when we had kind of a fun time. And Susan, you mentioned a really fun party that you guys did a while ago with your office group. Yeah, we went to, uh, it's called Board and Brush. I think it's actually a chain. We have them here too. Oh, it's so much better than those like painting with a twist type things because those painting with the twist things, like you make something and I'm like, eh, sometimes it turns out okay, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> like I, as all of our listeners know, I am the least artistically inclined amongst the three of us. And like, I can go there and make something absolutely beautiful and somewhat useful. Like the first year we did it, I made a um, serving tray and we still use it at our house all the time. And this this last time that we went, I made, it's like a a Christmas door sign. And it says, you know, we wish you all a Merry Christmas from the Hudson's and stuff. And it's so neat because you like, the wood is already kind of put together, but then you sand it and you distress it and then you stain it and then you do the stenciling and then you get to paint it. And it is so like gratifying and it's so much fun. And I'm like, every time I walk by one of them that I did, I'm like, wow, I did that. And like, that's definitely like not one of my gifts. (laughs) That sounds fun. You know, we have the painting places, but so this is like, you actually make something like out of wood, right? Right. I mean, you can make like serving trays, you can make wall decor, you can make the big stand things you put by your door. That's a sign things you'd buy at Hobby Lobby, but you get to make it yourself and you can put your names on it and personalize it and different things like that. It's fun. So Carrie, what about you? What's, what's a fun party you went to in the past? So we started a couple of years ago at Christmas because our office was always trying to figure out like, what do we do? What do we do for the Christmas party? Where do we go? That's fun. And, and in Vegas, we like, we have access to all this stuff. So we'd gone to like a bowling venue where they also do concerts and they've gone to like a ton of different things, but we realize all these places, like there's nothing like it's really hard in some of these places to actually sit down and talk to people and have a good time. So I decided, okay, I'll, I'll have my whole office over to my house. 
And, and so, so we did that and, and having the help, like, this is not something I could ever pull off by myself, but having the help of my office, we brought in fun food we bring in karaoke and we've brought in um, a tarot card reader in the past <laughs> and we've had um, just all sorts of stuff. And so I get to decorate our house and my goal is like, okay, how can I make this look like a small scale version of one of the casinos? And so I hang all these ornaments off of fishing line from the ceiling and it's just, it's so much fun to decorate and it's so much fun to have everybody over. And it's so much fun that I have helped cleaning up afterwards. Um, <laughs> that it's just, it's fun to just sit and talk and see everybody all dressed up and have it be both, both fancy and low key enough that you're not like yelling over some DJ or something like that. So those, those are my favorite parties. Like I love having my office over to my house so that we can hang out together and have fun. Being in Las Vegas, so I was thinking maybe you like pulled some Cirque du Soleil performers or something to do like acrobatics or... <laughs> That's actually probably on the list of things to do in a future year because we were talking about it the prior years and then and then COVID hit and that turned everything upside down. But yeah, there are sort formers who will go around and they'll do like acrobatics and things like that. I want to come to that party, Carrie. I'm going to invite myself to your house for that. <laughs> the beauty of living in Vegas is that there's all of the options. So what have you done, Abby? So one of my funnest parties, as I was thinking back, was when I early on, I trained, I did my fertility training in Louisville, Kentucky, and I stayed on faculty for several years thereafter. And so the town, like leading up to the Kentucky Derby, it's like just this big buildup for two weeks. There's there's a road race, there's a balloon race, there's all kinds of parties, private parties that people have and bigger parties, you know, that people have. And it's just, there's so much just, you know, things that happen in town that's so much, that are so much fun. And so one of the hospital systems at the time, Norton's, would rent out the Kentucky Derby Museum, which is right next. I mean, it's, it's right at Churchill Downs, literally the night before the Kentucky Derby. And so it was so cool because they would have all, all this delicious food and just like the buzz was in the air about the Derby and everybody, all these movie stars were in town. But we got the Derby Museum the night before. And one of the coolest things, if you've ever been to the Derby Museum, is you stand in a room and it's it's almost like oval in shape. It's a huge room and it has this surround sound screen where you can see the horse race. And like, it's, you feel like you're, as if you're one of the jockeys almost riding the horses and you kind of feel the excitement. And so that was kind of the build up. you know, you, everybody would talk and then they would show the big film and, and it was just fun. You could walk around the Derby and it was just, it was, you know, just kind of perfect because it was right at the time when the Derby was going to run the next day. So that was always fun to go there and they had all these ice sculptures of jockeys and horses and stuff. So it was really cool. That's cool. That's awesome. So, well, I, we're going to do a question episode, Susan. So we don't have to do the question of the day because it's going to be the question of the whole podcast. <laughs> and we do several of them. Exactly. All right. So let's kind of dive into this one. All right. So our first question is, so thankful for the wisdom you share on your podcast. I am currently 29, husband 28, started trying to conceive August 2020. They had an early miscarriage in December 2020 and one suspected chemical pregnancy July 21. In between those, they've taken pregnancy tests and two instances of positive home tests only to get period days later. Yearly visit with nurse practitioner prescribed 200 milligrams of progesterone after testing. However, we tested after the miscarriage but before the period came back, so they were wearied of having the test results being accurate. I've had spotting between periods and had stopped after being advised to stop the prescription and start again. In October, I got a normal period and had a positive ovulation test, first time using them a few days earlier than expected. Exactly a week later, I had another positive ovulation test. A week after that, I started another period, two weeks post my normally timed one. I reached out to my normal doctor and she advised I stop the progesterone and make an appointment with OB to advise on fertility. I have now started another period in November, exactly 30 days from my normal in October. I'm worried that these irregularities may be from receiving my second dose of COVID vaccine at the end of September or potentially from the prescription. My earliest appointment with the new doctor is in July. In the meantime, I'm working on losing about 10 pounds to be back at the weight I had when we first had a pregnancy. Should I be looking into a reproductive endocrinologist or wait until I speak with the new doctor? Thanks so much for all you do. Can you go back and tell us her age? I think you said 29. Yeah, she's 29, husband's 28. And it's been more than a year that they've been trying to get pregnant. So the answer on the REIs, we would all recommend an REI, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think in part of the 
I mean, just you hit the 12 months of not getting pregnant like that or, or trying to not having a successful ongoing pregnancy. So that by itself hits it. Whenever you hear abnormal cycles, that's another check mark for go see an REI sooner rather than later, because if you're not having normal periods, then the likelihood of you ovulating in a in an effective manner is a lot lower. Now, as for the reason for that, you had, um, you had mentioned potentially the progesterone supplementation as well as the COVID vaccine. So I think many of us don't necessarily give progesterone supplementation unless we are rock solid on the timing of everything. I know that when I have given it in the past, in the way that you have been given it, it tends to mess with people's cycles more than it helps. And there's really not a whole lot of data that shows that you get a lot of benefit out of it in the time frame between ovulating and getting a positive pregnancy test. So what I typically do is make sure you have the prescription on hand. As soon as you get a positive test, you start taking it. But when you're just timing it, okay, I'm on the second two weeks of my cycle. I think it does tend to interfere more with the regularity of your cycle. And while the theory behind it is good of I'm going to take it two weeks after, you know, after my last period, right after I ovulate, the execution tends to be more variable just because of the natural irregularities and timing. So I, I think that progesterone may be playing a role in it. And, you know, your doc didn't do anything wrong. Like the biology behind it is sound. It's just the real world application of it is kind of a pain in the ass. So that's kind of my take on it. What do you guys think? Well, another thing I picked up too, reading between the lines, you had mentioned that you're going to maybe try and lose some weight um, and get back to the weight you were when you got pregnant. And so, you know, weight for some people doesn't make a big difference, but sometimes we see in some patients, even 10 pounds can be the difference between having irregular cycles and having more regular cycles. And maybe that's part of the issue, maybe with all the stress and anxiety of everything that's been going on and trying to get pregnant, you know, maybe you've gained weight and 10 pounds doesn't seem like a lot, but it can make a difference hormonally. Um, it's kind of like, you know, I tell patients if they have a relative that, you know, has a history of diabetes, if they gain weight, gain 10 or 15 pounds, they can become diabetic. If they lose 10 or 15 pounds, a lot of times the diabetes goes away. And there's some patients with irregular cycles that that can happen. If they gain 10 pounds, it shifts their hormones in a way that makes them cycle irregularly. If they lose the weight, it can change that. So I would, you know, I don't know if what your body weight is right now, but I would say certainly work on losing weight. That's probably going to be one of the bigger components that will help you ovulate more regularly. And I would say it's, you know, it's been more than a year. I would definitely see an uh, REI, a reproductive endocrinologist, because they'll probably be a little bit more proactive in trying to get you to ovulate more proactively and putting you on ovulation induction medicine and probably monitoring you a little bit more closely just because that's what we do. I mean, we do that with everybody. And so pretty quickly, you'll know whether the dose of medicine that you're on is working or not. And if it's not, you know, you can move on to more aggressive therapy much more quickly. I agree. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. Our next question is, hi, thank you for all that you do. I find your podcast so helpful and informative. I am 30 years old and been trying to get pregnant since April, 2021. Since I always had irregular periods and I have an autoimmune disease, my OB recommended I see an RE from the start, which we concur. Uh, we started <laughs> with lechazol and timed intercourse and got pregnant after four months, which unfortunately ended in a chemical pregnancy. I have always had mature follicles about three each cycle and I ovulate. All of my blood work looked normal and my husband's semen analysis was great. After the next cycle of letrozole and timed intercourse not working, we did letrozole with IUI, which did not work. My RE suggested one more Medicaid cycle with an IUI, which I'm about to do before going to IVF. This has been an emotional journey and part of me wants to do IVF and another part of me thinks I should do another IUI or just Medicaid timed intercourse since I was able to get pregnant once. I would love to hear your thoughts. All right, Susan, your turn to go first. What do you think? <laughs> so it sounds like you have done, it sounds like at least four, maybe about to do five cycles. And what we know when we're looking at you know, ovulation induction with timed intercourse or ovulation induction, especially with IUI, is that your best chances are in your first three cycles. And during those first three cycles, you're gaining some degree of momentum. And after that, your success rates really start to plateau. And it's not that you can't get pregnant on those future cycles. It's just that your odds aren't really climbing and they're really, you know, they're starting to become kind of stagnant. And so I am a big advocate at 
this point, I think it's very reasonable for you to be kind of considering, discussing, uh, you know, really starting to understand the details of IVF and how it can be appropriate in your case. So I think you've made a good try. I don't think that there should be really any guilt or qualms about going towards IVF. I mean, if you wanted to do another cycle or two, it's probably not going to hurt anything except for potentially your checkbook. Well, and I would just add too that another option, which I'm not saying everybody would want to do this, but I know in our state, IVF is not, coverage for IVF and really for fertility treatment is not mandated. So most of what I talk about is success rates with treatments and cost with treatments. And, you know, it's a big jump from what you're doing financially. And I'm sure you know that from, you know, even if you want to do it from the letrozole and the IUI to IVF, the other option would be to think about doing injectable drugs with insemination. And that's going to run you, you know, a couple thousand dollars. It's not going to be cheap to do it, but that would be another alternative. And it's more time consuming. It's sort of a hybrid almost between IVF and doing the letrozole and the IUI because we still usually recommend doing IUI with it. The success rate's a little bit better, but not significantly better. But sometimes if financially right now, it's just IVF's not on, on the horizon for you, that would be another alternative that might bump up your chances a little bit. It will also increase your chance of multiples. So more than one baby, twins, triplets, et cetera. And that, you know, that's a real concern for us for sure. And so Susan Lee, you look like you're about to say something. (laughs) So I want to counter it with the number one, she's 30. And so I'm a big proponent of not using pure injectables in women this young. And I think there's pretty good data to say that if you can get somebody to ovulate, especially super ovulate using oral or oral and injectables, that really the success rates for pure injectables, all you're doing is raising the risk of multiples. And then you're also you know, it's costing a lot more. I mean, meds for injectable cycles can run 500 to $2,000. And that's a big chunk of change you could potentially put towards something that's going to give you much better chances of success. Yeah. I mean, I would agree. IVF certainly gives you a much better chance of success and that would be my preference too. But I think some patients are not ready to do that for whatever reason. And, and yeah, I think it's a viable alternative to try and see, because I definitely have had people who have gotten pregnant with that. And, and I have had multiples, I'll have to admit, but you know, it doesn't happen commonly. What are your thoughts, Carrie? I tend to steer away from the injectables just because I'm looking for kind of biggest bang for your buck in terms of if we can get multiple embryos, that means we get multiple shots of pregnancies and you ultimately get what you want. Cause this is not about going through fertility treatment. It's about getting a baby. A lot of patients forget about that because of the financial considerations. And so, you know, I would tend to lean more towards she's ovulating, eggs are getting out. And so would lean more towards going to IVF rather than stopping at injectables, just because I, I think that those cycles are stressful for everybody because it's a lot of medications or more injections. The timing is less precise and you just, you run a much higher risk of higher order multiples. Like twins are one thing, triplets are a whole different ball game. So, you know, I think, I think at this point, having done four cycles of timed intercourse and two of IUI, all with meds, I think it's reasonable to, to start moving on just because you're getting diminishing returns with what you're doing. So, you know, I wouldn't fault anybody for going a couple more cycles, but I also worry that people are going to get burnt out by doing more of the same and having it not working. And while those cycles are considerably cheaper, the cheaper is different than cheap. And so, you know, I would, I think her plan's pretty reasonable. Like, I kind of like it. So. All right. Next question. So I had a retrieval and they got 16 eggs. 13 of those were mature and 11 of them fertilized with my husband's sperm. I was very happy with all those numbers. I had heard slash read that 30 to 50% would turn into blastocysts on day five. I only had one. Any advice or insight on what I could do to get a higher percentage to blastocyst? How old is this patient? She didn't mention her age, did she? No, she did not. Okay. So age is an important part of that. The other component of that is that the number of blastocysts you get in part is dependent on what the lab is seeing and how they grade things. Because it's not just, do you have a blastocyst? It's, do you have a blast that has an inner cell mass and trophectoderm? Because we see patients all the time who make blasts, but if they don't have the components that you need then it's really not a usable blast. And so blastulation and good blastulation are two related, but different things. Um, So that might be a question for your RE. Um, Certainly age has a large 
part to do with this. Carrie, I'm going to interrupt real quick. So just to clarify what Carrie's saying is, did you just have one usable blast and there were other blasts there, but they weren't good quality? Right. Right. Okay. Right. And so, you know, so I would look at that in terms of what you can do to improve it. A lot of it's going to depend on what your cycle looked like. Your like your REI may be able to go through and say, Hey, you know, this number, this number, this number tipped us off that maybe we should change this next time without knowing the details of your cycle. It's kind of hard to, to know that, but just looking at your straight numbers of 16 eggs to 13 mature to 11 fert, those numbers are pretty reasonable. I think that uh, one of the key things is, did you make blasts versus usable blasts? And then really talking with your REI and say, okay, when you look at my cycle, did the numbers you saw and the results you saw, are they what you want? Is there anything we can improve? And be aware, they may say, yeah, your cycle actually looked really good. And so, yes, we can make these changes, but know that sometimes those changes are just changes for the sake of making a change rather than changes because we think they're going to do a whole lot better. One of the pieces of information that we didn't hear either was about the male side of it. So, you know, it takes two to tango. So, you know, sometimes a male component can make a difference as well. And so if the sperm had really poor morphology, it can impact fertilization. And I agree your fertilization was good, but, you know, we don't really under, quite understand how it can affect development. Although I will say, usually for about the first five days of development, we think it's largely related more to the egg. But, you know, I've certainly seen situations where the eggs look really great and just the morphology is really the big thing that, and we just don't see good embryo development. You know, I think where you fell off the curve was the number that I agree with Carrie. Everything else looked good. 16 eggs, 13 mature, 11 fertilized is reasonable. I usually say about a third of the mature eggs as a general rule form blastocyst. And so I would have expected that you would have had, you know, three, maybe even four blastocyst. And so I do think there was some issue there, but unfortunately, sometimes we just can't figure out what that issue is. And sometimes it just takes doing another stimulation maybe changing the medicine a little bit that can sometimes make a difference. I've definitely seen where if we do one stimulation and then we do something a little bit differently, it can make a difference as far as fertilization and development. So if it were me personally, I would think about doing another cycle again. Now, if you have you know the same outcome in a second cycle, well, that's kind of a horse of a different color. I'd be a lot more concerned that there's not a whole lot that the lab would be able to do to kind of improve your outcome and embryo development. I tend to be an optimist and I like to think that everybody practices equal medicine and everybody's labs are as fantastic as our labs and everything like this, but it might be something for you to look at as to your lab success rates as well, just to make sure that they're kind of up to par with what would be considered national averages and things like that, because unfortunately not every IVF lab is equal and maybe it might be a lad thing. As much as we hate to think about that, that does exist out there. So it is something to consider. I mean, hopefully it's just a great lab and it was unfortunately not a great cycle, but it is something to do a little research on. All right, our next question. Hi, first I wanna say this podcast is a godsend. I've learned more about my fertility and questions to ask my physician. In 2018, I had an HSG, test came back normal with no block tubes, but my right tube on the ultrasound looked wild all over the place. My left tube looked like every healthy and normal diagram. After this test a year later in 2019, I suffered an ectopic pregnancy. It wasn't until I was rushed to the hospital and multiple tests learned my first pregnancy bursted my right tube. According to the test, I was six to seven weeks. Is that possible? Since that moment, I've seen a fertility doctor who's told me my only option will be IVF because after four Medicaid cycles, including an injectable cycle, he believes my viable left tube is also damaged. I am now 31. AMH has been higher than normal, but not too concerning. 2.9. I am not insulin resistant. Genetic testing on my husband and I came back as normal. When we do injectable cycles, I produce a great amount of follicles. My lining measures over 12 millimeters. Before I start IVF, do you believe it could be that my tube is damaged or is there an underlying issue I'm not seeing? Thank you. You ladies are the best. I mean, I kind of think at this point, IVF is on the horizon no matter what, whether it's your tube or it's, it's not your tube. You've kind of done what we would normally recommend for three or four cycles, and that's some sort of fertility treatment. You know, you mentioned that your right tube didn't look quite normal in 2018 and that the left tube looked good. And 
you know, even though dye goes through the tube and it looks normal, there can be microscopic scar tissue within the fallopian tube. And, you know, if you look at a picture of a sperm, it's really tiny in comparison to the egg. So the sperm can get through really tiny spaces in the tube. And, you know, the sperm has to swim all the way through the fallopian tube to get to the egg and bring about fertilization. The egg is the largest cell in your body. And so once it fertilizes, sometimes as it goes back through the fallopian tube, it can get stuck. And so I would tend to agree that, you know, I don't know for sure that your tube, if the HSG looked good, you know, if somebody looked at you surgically, they might find that maybe you do have some scar tissue there that you don't know about, even though the tube is open and spills. You know, we kind of worry that whatever affected your right tube potentially and increased your risk of ectopic could affect your left tube as well. So if you'd had, you know, endometriosis or some sort of pelvic infection, a lot of times that can affect both tubes and maybe one tube just got affected more than the other. But I think regardless of what of whether or not we think that tube is involved or not, you're kind of at the point anyway where we would all probably recommend IVF as your next step. But you have a great AMH and high, in my book, high is pretty good. So 2.9 is excellent. So I think you'll do great with IVF. I think you'll make a lot of eggs and I think you'll have probably really nice embryos. Yeah, I think the important part is, I always say we live in an information age and we like to Google why the sky is blue. And... <laughs> We're so used to having answers to everything, but unfortunately in fertility, we don't always have that answer. And I, I always worry about patients who are, yes, we like to pro try to provide as much of an answer as possible, but sometimes we just don't have one. And sometimes patients kind of get lost in the weeds of trying to figure out what is exactly the problem versus okay, we've done these treatments. We know that regardless of what your problem is, we probably need to go down another treatment and it's not counterindicated for your situation. And so I just hate for people to kind of get lost in the, I need to have a diagnosis before getting to that baby. What are your thoughts, Carrie? Agree with all those things. Like you've got pretty good evidence based on both imaging and real world experience with that ectopic that those tubes are damaged. So at this point, your odds look pretty good with IVF. So move forward and may you have a baby. All right. Thank you so much for all your informative ideas on podcasts for IVF. It has really helped break down this process into simpler steps that seems manageable to get through. And I look forward to tuning in each week. I am a 32 year old female who has unexplained infertility. I went through my first egg retrieval and was able to get 15 eggs. After a few days, only three were suitable for PGT testing. From there, only one was found to be genetically normal. My doctor is recommending ERA before transfer. Would you recommend this as a next step? I am wondering if the results were change anything significantly moving forward for transfer. So this one, we're going to have difference of opinions. <laughs> Go Carrie. So when you look at ERA, the goal is to make sure that we have the appropriate timing for when we transfer. And that's really balanced off of progesterone exposure. Because when you look at some of the studies with the ERA, they're looking at, do you have adequate progesterone exposure? And the studies themselves base that off of using either vaginal progesterone, injectable progesterone, or oral progesterone. Those are three wildly different types of giving progesterone. Usually injectable is kind of the, the gold standard in the sense that your levels go high. It's very clear what you get and that you have good levels. Oral is generally considered as not adequate. Vaginal, there's a ton of debate about it. So there have been some studies that have come out relatively recent, like within the past six months or so, uh, six months to a year that show the differences between injectable and vaginal. And so, you know, my personal thought is that when you're giving adequate progesterone, the ERA is not going to do a whole lot in changing what you do. I think that there may be some value in it. I think that we have no idea who the right population is. So I don't typically do that because we give, we give a ton of progesterone, which means our patients have sore bums um, from the injections, but the success rates tend to be pretty good. So I don't, I don't typically use that. I'm checking other things instead to look at the, the uterus, like a hysteroscopy, like, you know, considering a mock cycle, that kind of stuff. So that's my opinion. I don't tend to use them because when you really look at the, the base of it, there's not a whole lot of good, hard data behind it. And the plausibility behind it, I think is questionable. In full disclosure, I will say in our practice, we usually, in fact, if there's one embryo, usually we like to talk to patients about it because I think, you know, my bent is kind of like Carrie. I don't know that it has benefit. I don't think that we really know. There's not good data to show that it has benefit. But the reason we as a group at Nashville Fertility have sort of decided to talk to patients at least 
about it if they only have one embryo is we don't want anybody to look back and go, well, gosh, Dr. Evelyn, why didn't you tell me about this test? If I knew this test existed, you know, even if there's a chance it may be helpful, I want to do it. And so kind of our gender rule is if we have a patient that only has one embryo to transfer, we like to at least talk about it so that you won't feel like we don't know what we're talking about or that we didn't mention something that's really valuable for you. And we certainly don't want you to look back and go, gosh, well, if I'd known that, I would have done the ERA biopsy. But I agree with Carrie. I don't, I talk about it, but I always say, you know, it's your choice. But if you're asking me, I don't think it's, you know, we just don't have enough data to really say that it's beneficial for you. And, and I've had the conversation, it seems like a lot this past week, past couple of weeks with patients who, when I talk to them about the progesterone, they're like, ugh, I really don't want to do intramuscular progesterone. What do you think about doing X, Y, or Z? And, you know, I always say everything's negotiable. My preference is to do intramuscular progesterone because we can measure those levels a lot better than we can with other things. And so it makes us all feel more reassured. Plus, it's been something that we're all used to using throughout our whole careers. And we know that it's reliable and it's, you know, predictable. And we know that it it works. But we also know that, you know, makes your butt sore. And so, you know, I have two kids that I got pregnant with frozen transfers. And so I had all the lumps and bumps on my bottom to prove it too. (laughs) They eventually went away, I will say, but it was not pleasant. But, you know, I think, you know, if that's the difference between you not doing a transfer, then, you know, that can be negotiable. But I do think intramuscular progesterone is probably the best route to go um, with the transfer. So in my practice, I do progesterone a little bit differently. I tend to do a combination progesterone type of cycle, which recent data has said is equal to the IM progesterone. So if patients want to do pure intramuscular progesterone, I have absolutely no problems with that. But I would say most of my patients do a combination of vaginal and injectable progesterone to make sure they have great progesterone exposure. In somebody who has one embryo to transfer, I mean, the way I kind of look at it is that in our lab, if you have a chromosomally normal embryo, we know it's going to stick about 60% of the time, somewhere between 60 to 70%, just depending on some different factors. And if it doesn't, we know that half of those are because there is, if I do an ERA in the future, half of them are going to show evidence that we either need more or less. Most people are going to need more progesterone than the average person. There are some doctors out there who are just like, well, just give more progesterone early, which you can do. I tend to like to do that ERA test because in my brain, it kind of means I'm taking guesswork out of the equation. And, you know, if I can take 20% of the guesswork out of an equation, I'm in fan of doing it, but I do offer it as an option. You don't have to do it, but it is something available. And, you know, it's one of those hindsight is 2020 type of things. If it doesn't work and then you're like, that was my only embryo. And now we go and do an ERA cycle and it shows that you needed more progesterone. You know, I don't want either of us to look back and do the shoulda, woulda, coulda type of thing. But that that's just my perspective. Lots of different opinions there and something that you'll see that reflected in all of our national meetings. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, let's do one more question. Hi guys. I just wanted to say, I absolutely love your podcast. I am currently going through my first round of IVF and going on the internet to learn research is so overwhelming and honestly scary. Finding and listening to your podcast weekly has felt like a godsend. And I look forward to your new episode every week. I just have to say, I love these listeners. <laughs> are you making this up, Susan? I am like, not are, making are, are it just, up. I'm like, y'all are just, y'all rock, y'all rock. You're just reading the questions where people like us. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes us feel so good when we hear that people actually appreciate and, and have good use for for this. So we're super glad for that. I'm glad. Absolutely. I want to get your thoughts and opinions on doing a Medicaid FET versus a non-Medicaid FET. I have heard it is generally the same outcome, but I wanted to see what you would both suggest for my current situation, benefits, downsides to both options. I'm 31 years old, have been diagnosed with male factor, been trying for a year and a half with no prior pregnancies or miscarriage. Extremely regular period, every 28 days for four days, and always able to detect ovulation. All of my hormone levels have come back within normal range. I am totally open to doing both options. The shots don't bother me, and my work is also extremely flexible around my IVF schedule, so knowing the timing of everything doesn't necessarily affect me either. All medications are also covered by my insurance. So my advice is do what your clinic does best. (laughs) Absolutely. I agree. I would agree with that. So all of us have our own preferences of things that we 
we just like better. And there may or may not be data behind it. There may or may not be, you know, any, I don't want to say irrational, you know, rational reason implying that there's an irrational reason, but all of us in the same way that when you go into a public bathroom, you probably wash your hands at the same sink or go into the same general toilet stall, the first one, the end one, somewhere in the middle, like all of us have our preferences and it's just what we like and what See, hey Carrie, let me interrupt for a minute. I oh would have now what? I would have used ice cream as an example. I don't think I would have used public bathrooms, but hey, that's just me. <laughs> I park in the same row at the grocery store every single time so I don't lose my car. <laughs> you go to where where is most comfortable for you. And so as physicians, we all have what we like best. And saying that, I actually don't know that I go to the same general (laughs) stall at any point in time now that I actually think about it when you put it in terms of personal preferences. Same church pew, for sure. Same church pew, right. Because I'm holy and that is clearly demonstrated by everything I say. (laughs) Like, yeah. So when I go to the same church pew every weekend, um, (laughs) all of us have our preferences and we're going to know what works best in our hands. And so when you ask your doc, they're going to have a real clear answer to that. And so I would ask your doc because medically it probably doesn't make a huge difference as long as that's what they're comfortable with. They're good at, that's what their center likes to do. And their numbers too. So a lot of times patients will say, okay, for my age and, you know, for this type of stimulation, what's your success rate? And a lot of us have that data available. We might not have it like immediately available, but we can get that for you. And, and another thing too, I was going to point out when she said, an unmedicated versus a medicated cycle, that can mean different things too. You know, there's there's all different types of tweaks that we can do that, you know, that would change kind of the way we do it. So that's not a standard, like this is a medicated cycle and this is what everybody would do. And this is an unmedicated cycle and this is what everybody would do. Well, we appreciate you joining us today. And you can also visit us on fertility.suncensor.com to submit specific questions. All questions will be answered on the podcast anonymously for our Ask the Doc segment or even... An episode idea. We'd love to hear from you for that. So don't hold back. We'd love to hear from you. So be sure to subscribe and leave us a review in iTunes. We'd love to hear from you. We're also on Instagram and Facebook. So hop on by and leave us a follow, say hello, give us an episode idea. We love to hear it all. As always, this podcast is intended for entertainment and is not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. All right. We'll see you guys soon. Bye. 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 We want to thank Ovation Fertility for sponsoring today's podcast. On the road to parenthood, many of our listeners find themselves in need of fertility testing, IVF, and other related services, such as egg donation, genetic testing, or gestational surrogacy. Ovation is a one-stop shop for services that many people may need as they go through fertility care. You can learn more about Ovation services for hopeful parents at ovationfertility.com.